This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 246, recorded on July 8th, 2021. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schachter. Well, hello there. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? Keeping I'm well? Holding I'm holding up. <laughs> holding up? <laughs> very good. That's all we can ask for. <laughs> also joining us from somewhere in North Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. Good to see you, each each of you. Are you far from the Canadian border? Like Yes. I'm on the western side of, of Michigan. I would hold up my palm and point out where I am on the mitten, but... This is only audio, only so that audio. won't help. Okay. And from <laughs> Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Uh, you had, last time we recorded, you had a, a lightning strike, and now you have a, a hurricane. Tropical, tropical storm come through last night. One of the Disney princesses dropped, as I was telling Elio before the show started, dropped California's three years of rain in the space of three hours. We had about six inches of rain. And uh, between three more three in the morning and seven this morning, and uh, there were flooded streets and trees uprooted. And boy, it's tough living in Charleston, isn't it? It, it appears to be. <laughs> it appears to be. Wow. All right. Well, that's our uh, weather meteor- report. Meteor- meteorological report for Twib. And now moving on to microbiology, uh, we have a snippet from Michelle. We do. It's a paper titled Hierarchical Cell Death Program Disrupts the Intracellular Niche Required for Bocholderia Tylodensis Pathogenesis. And it's from David Place, Shelby Christensen, Shraddha Talurda, Peter Vogel, Sabaro Malarati, and Thirumola Devi Kanagati. And I apologize for not pronouncing that beautifully. They are from the Department of Immunology um, at St. Jude's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. And this was published in MBIO just um, in late June. So the topic in general is our innate immune response. So this is the defenses that we're each born with. We don't have to acquire these defenses by experience with eating dirt and being exposed to uh, a random supply of (laughs) microbes. And in particular, we're going to focus on inflammation, which um, we've each experienced if we've had a splinter, for example, and you get pus and, and redness and soreness. That's the neutrophils and the, and the leukocytes come screaming in uh, to clean up whatever um, problem there is locally. So inflammation in general is, is protective in a wide range of infectious diseases. But we also know it needs to be tightly controlled. So if inflammation is out of control, we can get morbidity and mortality from um, a cytokine, cytokine storm, for example, hyperactive immune response. And we also know that dysregulation of inflammation can lead to uh, rheumatoid arthritis or Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, diabetes. So understanding how inflammation is regulated is great of great interest um, to scientists and, and also, of course, the pharmaceutical industry, which is looking for um, new targets for drugs to control um, a range of infections. So the experimental model this group um, uses is um, infection of macrophages or mice with Burkholderia. So they use um, as a laboratory strain uh, Burkholderia tylodensis, but it is a representative of some really nasty pathogens where the mortality can approach 50%. So these are Burkholderia pseudomallei and mallei, which cause um, different types of diseases of animals, but also humans. Another problem with the Brocholderia species are that they're naturally um, antibiotic resistant. So we really need to um, come up with more creative ways to uh, control these um, deadly infections. So what they're able to do is take advantage of the large literature on programmed cell death. So this refers to um, basically a cell deciding to take one for the team. Um, It commits suicide and either goes quietly into the night, um, for example, during 
development or um, commits a fiery cell death uh, where it um, denies the pathogen a safe haven to replicate while also releasing pro-inflammatory cytokines to call other um, leukocytes and cell-mediated defenses um, to the site of infection. So they um, painstakingly separate um, the program cell death into uh, what we know about uh, four different types of cell death. So apoptosis is the quiet form that is really important during development, where during tissue remodeling, some cells have to die, and then they send signals so that they're quietly eaten by macrophages and taken out of the of the system. And then pyrotosis is the fiery cell death. Um, we know we've learned a lot about it. It requires um, toll-like receptors or nod-like receptors to detect really broadly conserved microbial um, molecules from viruses or from microbes, bacteria. Um, and that can trigger um, a cascade, which in, um, induces um, porous cells that then release these pro-inflammatory cytokines. There's a related kind of inflammatory death called necrotosis, and it's related, it's another pro-inflammatory cell death, but it needs a different set of um, cell components. And then, most recently, we've learned that um, each of these um, cell death pathways are actually um, mediated by a um, scaffold um, in the cell where particular components of each of the cell death pathways can physically interact and therefore there can be crosstalk between these different cell pathways. So you can imagine if one is not doing the job, it could activate the next one in line. So in general, um, what we're going to see is that um, our cells are designed so that the fiery cell death, pyrotosis, is kind of the first responder and then um, if the signal, um, the inflammatory signal, the stimulus is not um, taken care of by pyrotosis, then the cell may increase its frequency of apoptosis, the more silent type of death that uses a different set of cell components. And then um, later still, if that doesn't take care of the problem, there can be this other um, cell death, which is called um, pano. Ptosis, panoptosis. <laughs> Trying to avoid that P, aren't you? I can, <laughs> um, which requires a, a different set of um, caspase um, proteases uh, to mediate um, a more silent cell death. So what the authors do is take advantage of mice that lack key components of each of these cell death pathways, and they use their, um, their Borcolderia strain that either is fully competent to infect or they have a strain that um, is defective in a key part of pathogenesis. And then by infecting either um, macrophages that encode or lack key components of pyrotosis or apoptosis or the panpitosis, um, they're able to then um, uh, quantify the yield of bacteria in the macrophages. They can all also look um, in the microscope at, for certain hallmarks of cell death, like if it's pyrotosis, they'll have a permeable, permeable cell membrane, or if it's apoptosis, they'll have condensed nuclei. And then they also know during bulk dairy infection, um, the bacteria trigger fusion of host cells, and they see experimentally that that then promotes spread of bulk dairy from cell to cell and increases um, replication. So they do a, a really um, systematic job of um, using um, assays of the cells. Also, they can do biochemistry. They can look for cleavage of particular components by uh, caspases, which are involved in um, this inflammatory um, complex called an inflammasome. They can look at phosphorylation, phosphorylation of key components. And then they can validate the uh, results that they see in the macrophage cultures by um, doing intranasal inoculation into a mouse that, e again, either is fully competent for all three types of cell death or is defective for one or another. And in general, what they learn from a, a large number of really um, nicely done quantitative um, biochemical, cell biological, microbiological assays and um, uh, mouse infections is that um, pyrotosis is really the first critical response. And if that um, pathway is deficient, then you see um, a higher yield of bacteria, more cell death, and then um, an increase of apoptosis, which um, works to then get the infection under control. And then um, 
if the, that pathway is defective, they can then see evidence for this um, pan op, pan optosis. Who knows how to say that? Well, if you want to avoid the P, it would pan, it'd be panotosis. Panotosis, yeah. Right. Avoid that middle P, but say the first P. Yeah, it panotosis. seems like what you want. Some people don't avoid it, but apparently in Michigan they do. <laughs> I think I will. <laughs> um, so that is their um, experimental model and their key conclusions. And um, they make a convincing argument that um, this is an excellent model system for really um, understanding the molecular detail of the each um, cell death pathway and also how there's crosstalk um, in, um, in the cell through these um, large protein complexes so that the cell can... Um, ramp up inflammation carefully and only when it's needed so that they do only create only enough inflammation to get the infection under control, but not so much inflammation that you'd actually do more tissue damage and get exacerbate the pathology. So um, this is a, from a group that has really been a leader in studying mechanisms of um, uh, program cell death, especially um, pyrotosis and um, coordinating it now with this um, other uh, type of cell death. So I um, applaud the authors for their really uh, rigorous and systematic uh, work. One of the highlights of this paper is figure five. And since this is Oakman Access, you folks can take a look at it. And what they do in in this figure is it's a graphical graphical model for the roles of cell death pathways caused by Burkholderia or these facultative intracellular parasites. And their scheme that they show in the figure shows how you can get this pyroptosis and apoptosis and then finally this new version that they're talking about and it really describes what what's actually going on so if you're new to this field of program cell death it's really a nice model to help you keep the cast spaces straight in your mind and and figure out what's going on so i i was really glad to see that summary slide yeah, and, and they've got a lot of really clear quantitative data that backs it up. So you can see that if they um, uh, prevent pyrotosis, you can then see an increase in um, the other cell death pathways. So it's, it's quite convincing. Now, as you, as you disrupt first pyrotosis, then apoptosis, you get increasing death, right, of the right. Uh, mice. So those yep. are essential for limiting the infection, right? Yeah, and you can also see that the um, bacteria are just spreading like wildfire in mm -hmm. these uh, fused host cell um, uh, masses. Uh, and you, so this is right up your alley, Michelle. You're you're into intracellular bacteria, right? I am. Um, <laughs> yeah, and actually, this is the. 20th anniversary of um, the first description of pyrotosis mm -hmm. um, uh, by um, Molly Brennan and Brad Cookson, who were studying salmonella infection in macrophages. So um, it's amazing to see the progress that we've made over the last uh, 20 years. And, and the hope is that we can harness some of this knowledge um, and apply it um, for developing uh, new drugs, therapies. So in other intracellular infections, is this cascade of uh, program cell death similar? You know, you go through one, then the next, then the next? Um, certainly, there's evidence that um, when pyrotosis is blocked, you get um, a more um, severe um, infection. So, for example, in a Shigella infection, the mice will um, actually uh, die more quickly if pyrotosis can't respond. So, you might initially think when you see that the bacteria are triggering um, a macrophage to die and release inflammatory cytokines, you might think that that's the bacterium getting the upper hand. But actually, animal experiments make it really clear that that is a, a key part of the initial host uh, response, a local directed inflammation. Offhand, it sounds a little bit backwards, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, part of the deal is is the bacteria through their type 3 secretion systems and type 4 secretion systems are trying to confuse the host, not to turn these pathways on. Mm -hmm. And it's this yin and yang between the host and the pathogen that's that's really driving this, this in, infection model to to help us understand what's actually going on. Yeah, you raise a good point because this inflammatory pathway basically um, is acts as a selective pressure. So a number of um, intracellular pathogens and, and other pathogens now have um, virulence factors that can mm. go in and specifically um, abort 
some of the inflammasome um, components and and uh, response. So yeah, it's it's a fascinating um, area of study, and it's it's complicated. But they when you can bring both bacterial genetics and mouse genetics uh, to the table and a lot of quantitative assays, um, you can make progress. Why is it called fiery cell death, pyro? <laughs> pyro because of the inflammation. So that was to contrast it with apoptosis, uh, which had been well described um, by that point. And that is well known to be a silent infection. There's mm-hmm. You get cell death, but not inflammation. And remember, inflammation generally is associated with fever, hence the term pyro. Right. Hmm. Right. Okay. Very nice. And it's a different set of caspases that um, mediate apoptosis versus um, pyrotosis. And then necrotosis is a different set as well? Uh-huh. It, it is. It, it, different um, cell components are required. So that's why they're able to um, uh, separate them genetically using their mouse model. Okay. And so then the three of them, pyro, apo, and necro, are called panatosis, right? Yes. I hadn't heard that one before. Oh. Is there any others that are remain to be discovered, you think? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I wouldn't rule it out. Yeah, I wouldn't rule anything out when it comes between the yin and yang of bacteria and our immune bacteria and viruses in our immune system. Yeah. Right? And this the family of caspases is quite large. And now that we know that they um are can interact on a scaffold, mm-hmm. um yeah, opens up a lot of possibilities for, um, yeah, specificity. Nice. Thank you, Michelle. My pleasure. All right, moving on to our paper, Michael. So today's paper is entitled The Intracellular Passage Triggers a Molecular Response in Brucella Abortus That Increases Its Infectiousness. And this paper is from the Center of Investigation of Tropical Diseases and the Faculty of Microbiology at the University of Costa Rica in San Jose, Costa Rica, as well as the program Tropical Disease Investigation in the School of Medicine, Veterinary Medicine at the National University in Heredia, Costa Rica. And it's by Altamirano Silva, Corderno Serrano, Mendez Montoya, Jacon Diaz, Guzman Veri Moreno, and Chavez Olatera. And so this paper is in the July edition of Infection and Immunity. Unfortunately, it's behind the paywall. I wanted to bring this paper to our listeners' attention as it highlights an important issue that has been in the news of late that the reporters really don't know how to explain this this whole concept of infection infectiousness and and what it means. And you've probably been hearing about the SARS-CoV-2 viruses being more infectious and they're displacing other variants. So the story here, basically the title gives it away. As the bacterium, this gram-negative facultative intracellular parasite, which is a highly infectious microbe, that's responsible for infections in ruminants like cows and goats and other things, and it causes a zoonotic illness in people, triggers a molecular response. So as the brucella effectively multiplies inside the epithelial cell, and as it goes from where it replicates in the endoplasmic reticulum, and transits on its way out of the cell, that transit triggers a molecular response so that the micro, brucella, increases its infectiousness. So I thought I would start with their model. Michael, can I ask you even more basic? What is infectiousness? Um, In my (laughs) simple-minded concept, It's the number of microbes required to cause an infection. Okay. So fewer microbes, fewer more more infectious. That's my simple-minded definition. Brucella abortus has uh, a typical um, thought that one bacterium is sufficient to cause an infection in an adult human. 
Okay. It's, it's highly infectious. It's one of these select agents. Uh, so uh, we in the United States can't work on it without a special permit from the CDC and HHS. And, you know, so it, it has all sorts of strings attached to it. And the model really will give us a understanding or help us to develop an appreciation of the data that these authors did develop to arrive at their title. So their model is one where the bacterium has a two-component signaling system. So a quick review on two-component signaling systems. They sense when the microbe moves to a different type of environment. So typically what happens when you go from a neutral pH to an acidic pH, you get a protein conformational change. That typically results in the uh, phosphorylation of a histidine where a gamma phosphate is transferred. That results in a conformational change. Then that first component protein then transfers the gamma phosphate to a transcriptional activator molecule that in turn will express televirulence operon typically to turn on. So it's a positive form of control. You move from one environment to another. The bacterium senses this change of place. The histidines do their thing. They transfer the gamma phosphate from the hiss of the sensor to the regulators aspartate and the gene that is actually turned on in this particular case is called the vir B gene, which is participates in the release of the bacterium from the eukaryotic cell through a type four secretion system. And I don't have enough time to get into type four secretion. So I put a review in the show notes so you can, and it's in the public domain, so you should have no problems reading about it's from frontiers in microbiology. And then this, in turn, increases uh, the expression of a protein VJBR that results in this more efficient interaction with new host cells. If you will, it makes the bacterium better able to interact with a host cell because, again, everything is stochastic. The microbe is literally moving via Brownian motion, in, you know, getting transferred, and it has to encounter the host. So our approach today will be to present the data from the perspective of how do we know, and then more importantly, how did they show? And I'll let you be the judge of whether or not they were convincing. Now, spoiler alert here, they were. <laughs> their, their, their data are, are pretty, pretty remarkable. So what the first element of their pa- manuscript shows is that the intracellular, so they harvest intracellular brucella abortus. So these are brucella that have been growing inside epithelial cells for 48 hours. They bust them open, isolate the brucella, wash them up, And this microbe has an ability to interact better with new host cells than brucella grown in tryptocase soy broth. This is, you know, lab grown brucella. And if I could just interject, this was a major part of the first author, Pamela Silva's um, thesis, was developing painstakingly this assay for um, pulling intracellular bacteria out of the host cells, and then they can biochemically characterize them as well as measure their ability to invade the next cell. So that was really key to this study. So as as Michelle just jumped, how do you know and how would you show? Ask yourself, how would you design an experiment to demonstrate this phenomenon? And this was literally the key element of this young woman's dissertation. Now, I assume from the headline statement that the intracellular variant increases its ability to interact, that fewer intracellular bacteria are going to be required to initiate a new cycle or the intracellular replication of brucella. And here are the authors, again, as 
we just alluded to. They their their comparator is bacteria grown on tryptocase soy broth, which is a much more luxuriant medium than LB. It's got things like glucose in it. It's got tryptocase. It's got uh, buffers in it. So the bacterium is, is really quite happy in TSB. And they harvest this from the exponential phase where the majority of the population contains rapidly dividing cells. And then they compare it to these intracellular infection, and they recover them at 48 hours after they have been growing inside the epithelial cell. And the cell type that they used were HeLa cells. And what they found by measuring the number of infective cells, they saw that the intracellular inoculum was far more efficient at infecting naive epithelial or HeLa cells in that the multiplicity of infection ratio, one bacterium to one epithelial cell, was required to infect 2% of the population, while an MOI of 100 bacteria to one epithelial or HeLa cell was required to achieve the same level of infectiousness uh, from the extracellular, if you will, grown cells. So that's really pretty remarkable. And when you look at their figures, it's crystal clear. You just look at that first figure and you look at their MOI on the x-axis and you can see to get an equivalent level of replicating bacteria within cells that the ones grown extracellularly required 100 bacteria to get 2% of the population infected per cell, while the intracellular bacteria, it was only one. And to me, that was just remarkable. When they increase the MOI of intracellular bacteria t- uh, to 10 They were able to increase the infection efficiency threefold from where only 2% of the population was infected at an MOI of of one. But when you increase it by 10, you had an MOI of 6%. So that's showing you that these intracellular bacteria have some secret sauce attached to themselves that um, get them going. Then to compare the early infection dynamics of the intracellular bacteria against the extracellularly grown ones, they performed a competition experiment. And here the HeLa or epithelial cells were simultaneously infected with intracellular bacteria that could express green fluorescent protein and extracellular bacteria that didn't. And again, thinking, how do you know and how do you show Bacterial growth was monitored at different times by plate counting of serial dilutions. And at the time, at the initial time of infection, they saw a two log difference in the CFU count between the intracellular and extracellular bacteria required to infect the population. Again, this goes to helping them lead to the conclusion that the intracellularly grown bacteria were not necessarily better at replicating inside the eukaryotic cell, but simply better at their initial uptake. Now, confirming their suspicions, they did some really neat stuff um, by doing differential immunofluorescence labeling. And here the experiment was really clever. They grew the HeLa cells on cover slips and then using intracellularly grown brucella and the in vitro grown brucella, they added them to the cover slip at an MOI of 10 to 1. And at two hours, they washed the bacteria off. And the, the, with, then they, the living non-permeabilized cells were in, incubated with a conjugated cow antibody. So the antibody can't get inside the cell unless the bacterium brings it on in. And then they labeled it. And what you see is cells then were fixed and permeabilized and the intracellular bacteria 
were further detected with the rabbit anti-Brucella antibody and an Alexa Floor Plus 594 conjugated goat anti-rabbit IgG red, and the percentage of the cells followed their hypothesis. The conclusion they reached from this series of two experiments was intracellular bacteria were significantly better at entering the epithelial or HeLa cell. Then using the three parameters, they develop a quantitative measure to know the number of intracellular bacteria per 100 cells. And again, looking at the second figure in their panel D, you can immediately appreciate, yes, the intracellular bacteria reach significantly higher numbers than the extracellular um, creatures. The one detail I didn't burn you with in the first experiment is that they had gentamicin present in the medium during their intracellular assay and so in the next experiment, set of experiments, they're going to ask if naturally exiting or release brucella can retain the properties of the extracted intracellular s- cells. Remember, the brucella in its infection goes from multiplying at the endoplasmic reticulum into these um acidic vacuoles that are then dumped out into the cell. And the interaction of these release bacteria with epithelial cells was assessed by observing, again, the infection yields, and they were, again, found to be similar to those obtained with um, the uh, intracellular bacteria that they had developed the mechanism for harvesting. So, Bottom lining, if Brucella abortus naturally released from infective cells interacts more efficiently with host cells than extracellular bacteria. Now, to test if this increased interaction with host cells was dependent on the cell types of the primary and secondary infective cells, they then used a different combination of HeLa cells or epithelial cells and they used a murine macrophage. And all of their combinations tested resulted in a dramatic increase in the proportion of infection over the the control cells, which are these extracellularly grown uh, bacteria. And it, it is really what is so remarkable is that they have convinced you that growing intracellularly somehow does something to the programming of the bacterium so that it's better able to interact with our cells and be taken up. So what is happening to the phenotype of these intracellularly naturally released microbes? Why are they better at infecting cells? Well, At the late stages of this intracellular cycle or replicative stage, the brucella moves from this um, endoplasmic reticulum location to this acidic double-membraned lysosomal-associated membrane protein or LAMP-positive autophagy-related compartment, and they abbreviate that ABCV. And recall that LAMP1 stands for lysosomal associated membrane, and they are distributed amongst autophagocytic and endolysosomal organelles. And a lysosome is a membrane-brown eukaryotic cell organelle that contains digestive enzymes. And its mission in life is to break down excess or worn out eukaryotic cell parts And they also may be involved in destroying, invading viruses and bacteria. Now, here's where brucella gets really clever. This acidic pH is this key to turning on this two-component signaling system. And the two components are BVRR and BVRS. And again, this is just telling it it's moved from a neutral to an acidic area, and upon this stimuli, 
the response regulator induces the two operons to turn on, VJBR and VIRB, to explore if the same molecular mechanism is going on as Brucella transits to the acidic environment, that the two component signaling is actually doing what they think it is. They infected macrophages with intracellular Brucella and with the Brucella being purified at later stages. They then analyzed the bacteria recovered from the macrophages by immunochemical uh, methods. And why macrophages and not HeLa cells? Well, the answer was related to the experiment. Namely, they needed a sufficient yield of intracellular bacteria for their biochemical analysis. Then they asked, was there a canonical two-component signaling system going on in Brucella during this period as it moved from the ER to this acidic environment? And here they show us a beautiful FOSTAG SDS page gel. And you don't even have to understand how the assay works. You just look at the spots and you can immediately tell that these intracellular bacteria are so much better at doing this over the ones that have been grown extracellularly. So then as expected, they saw positive transcriptional regulation exer exerted by the two-component swapping of the phosphates and the protein levels. And VGRBR and VIRB increased late in the infection. And that's in one of the figures it's beautifully illustrated. And not surprising, the chicken and the egg experiment, VJBR needed to go up first before they saw an increase in VIRB. And so VJBR turns on VIRB. So what is VIRB and what does it have to do with the infectious process? Well, VIRB plays a role during the late stages of the intracellular infection cycle. And so here they hypothesize that it's the activation of this virulent circuit could also be involved in the increased ability of intracellular bacteria to again interact with host cells. Again, following our theme of how do you know and how do you show, here's where the experiments really get cool. And here's where you have to be a good student and read the literature. Cells were first infected with extracellular brucella abortus for 40 hours. Then they were treated before extraction of the intracellular bacteria with either bolifomycin, which is an antibiotic that inhibits or hampers the acidic vacular environment to promote BVR phosphorylation, the two-component signaling shuffle. And then they used a homoserine lactone which specifically blocks the DNA binding activity of the transcriptional activator, VJBR, or they use B81-2, which prevents the virulence product, VIRB8, from dimerizing to have its activity. Bottom lining this, VBRJ had the greatest impact on the bacterial interaction with cells affecting the percentage of cells associated with bacteria. The mean number of bacteria that they painstakingly showed us how to trust their calculation was the intracellular bacteria and the efficiency of internalization was beautifully illustrated. And again, in inhibition of the two-component signaling system reduce the proportion of cells associated with bacteria and the efficiency of internalization. In contrast, if you inhibited the VIRB function, this did not alter the parameters of early bacterial interaction. So by the time you need to make VIRB, the brucella has already made itself more attractive for up uptake. And these results were consistent with the general decrease in the number of intracellular bacteria uh, per 100 cells. Likewise, they agreed that with a decrease in the number of bacteria interacting with cells 
as determined by bacterial counting after the inhibition of the VJBR uh, DNA binding activity or the phosphorylation activity of the two-component signaling system, but it was not VIR-B. And, you know, they're literally walking us through their logic of how brucella can interact in such a way. Now, since the exposure of infectious cells to B812 was the only treatment that did not reduce the binding of intracellular bacteria, they then tested this co- that this compound inhibited uh, vir B function. And it did, as it was expected. Both the extracellular and intracellular bacteria exposed to B81-2 attached properly to cells but failed to replicate intracellularly. So what is going on during the bacterium's transit through this acidic compartment? Simply put, transit of brucella through these autophagosomes triggers this adherent phenotype by this vir B, or vir, i get, getting my vir's confused. Yeah, vir B, by vir B breaking this town in terms of cell cycle, imagine at late times of its infection cycle in the acidic autophagosomal compartment, BCV, that, that the bacterium reaches before exit is crucial for this increased bacterial adherence in a subsequent infection cycle. And the way I look at this is if you dump too many bacteria out into the extracellular milieu, you're going to give the immune system a greater opportunity to see it. So the fewer bacteria, so when they get dumped out into the extracellular space, if fewer bacteria are required to infect the next cell, then the immune system won't be able to react and target them for destruction. As we learned in the last paper from Brucella, how the immune system knows something does doesn't belong. But you're not making fewer bacteria. They're just no. more infectious. So more that doesn't efficient, just, more efficient transmission to the next cell. I'm not sure about the immune system business, Michael, but I, the uh, the the infectivity is clear. <laughs> yeah. So finally they tested to see if an acidic BCV environment is required to trigger bacterial adherence and they used a f- autophagosome inhibitor 3 methyl adenine, which hamper, hampers the function. And HeLa cells infected for th- 34 hours were treated with this inhibitor for an additional 14. After treatment, the bacteria were extracted and used in a new round of infection. And the treatment dramatically decreased the ability of the extracted intracellular bacteria to establish early interactions with host cells as determined both by immunofluorescence and plate counting. So what do we know? Since the autophagosome is acidic and since bolifomycin inhibits the increased bacterial adherence acquired by intracellular passage, they next evaluated where there's simply a low pH could mimic. And now here they expose bacteria to low pH medium for six hours And then they tested to see how well they interact with HeLa cells. And this treatment, just, you know, cooking them in acid, did not increase increase their ability to establish those enhanced interactions. So they tie this all up very nicely in the model that I I presented uh, earlier. And so after replication at the ER, the brucella reaches this insidic environment. The two-component signaling system detects the environmental shift. You get the triggering via autophosphorylation, which activates a transcriptional activator, which in turn then binds to the right promoters, enhancing their expression. And then the type 4 secretion component, VBRB, promotes the exit of the bacterium from the host cell whereas the VJBR only induces changes at the membrane that increases the interaction of the bacterium with the host cell in, in subsequent infection cycles. 
the author's results are in agreement with what has already been shown in the literature that vir B is required for exit of bacteria from cells. And they end their manuscript by offering us that this transcriptional activator factor, VJBR, functions as a master regulator to prepare the intracellular brucelli at later times of infection to infect new cells with this higher level of efficiency. And, you know, so reducing it to final thoughts, we have some beautiful work where we see the effects of a two-component signaling system in late events of intracellular life cycle dealing with bacterial egress between a co compartments that alters expression that then helps the bacterium interact with new host cells that increases the ability of the microbe to infect the next host cells using lower numbers or at greater levels of efficiency. Principally, it's a numbers game, and it's give-and-take evolution. Michael, I wonder if this is related to an age-old phenomenon. In the old days of microbiology, people cultured bacteria and kept them as type collections. When they measured their infectivity, the infectivity was way down. When what they did is they in, in, inoculated the strains into some host, and that upped the infectivity by a lot. Does yep. this explain what this old age-old phenomenon? This is going to explaining it at least from the perspective of brucella. Whether or not it explains it for E. coli K12, I don't know. But uh, E. coli K12 doesn't do much to animals. Yeah, it's probably a variation of the theme. Microbes, these two component signaling systems are really clever at figuring out where they're going. And then this concept of this master regulator turning things on is, is likely getting back to your question or your statement of the age old problem. And, and what's neat is that this, the, um, cells turn on what they need just in time. So like the type 4 secretion system is a really sophisticated apparatus, it takes a lot of protein synthesis to assemble it and then deploy it. So um, why, why use that? Why make it? Why expend the energy to make it when you're just replicating? Um, but the cell can sense when it's starting to be um, pushed out through the autophagosomal-like vacuoles fusing um, that it now needs to prepare for transmission, which is totally separate from replication. So it's really pleasing that the cell can um, switch between those two different states. And at the end of the day, it gets back to the fundamental issue of fitness. The bacterium doesn't want to expend the energy unless it has to. And it's, it's all about fitness. And it, fitness is intimately linked to infectiousness. And that's what we're seeing here. The bacterium is making a fitness calculation here because, you know, if you expend too much air and energy always making type 4 secretion systems, you're not going to be as efficient at making more cells. And the net consequence is you won't pass your genes vertically to the next generations. It's also true that, that we're good at studying um, microbial growth and we can make media to, to study growth um, in, you know, pure broth or um, in cells. But to study transmission takes, uh, takes some <laughs> more careful thought and, and uh, treatment of, of your um, cultures. So for, in this case, they had to, of course, extract the intracellular bacteria, purify them away, and then use them in the next step. So I think that's, um, that's a step that we need to think about as separate, and we need to develop separate assays um, for, for studying transmission. So this work, um, as Michael mentioned, was from um, a graduate student, Pamela Altamirano Silva. Um, she is, as he said, from um, Costa Rica, and she got her start when she started as a 16-year-old at the university studying microbiology. And she always had the notion she wanted to be a scientist, but she realized she didn't really know what that meant. She just imagined she'd sit in front of a microscope and look at bacteria. But mm -hmm. she did think 
it's a good path because she wanted to help society by working in a health-related area. And then as she went on in her study, she realized she could either go work in hospitals or the food industry, but, but yet she was really um, fascinated by research. So she sought out and was able to collaborate on a project with some um, chemists, biologists, and microbiologists. They were looking at algae, bacteria, and fungi that were associated with biodegradation of stone spheres, which are part of the national heritage um, in Costa Rica. So that was one of her first um, experiences. So once she finished her undergraduate degree, she knew she wanted more. So she approached one of her professors and asked if she could um, study with him for her microbiology degree. And it turns out she's now been um, with that research group for 10 years um, through as an undergrad and then her master's and then um, her PhD, which she'll be defending here um, any day now. She's right, um, right at the very tail end of her thesis. She did, as a master's student, start to study this type 4 secretion system and its regulation by this two-component system. And then, as we already pointed out, she also developed the um, assay for extracting intracellular bacteria so, so she could um, study their transmission. And she, she points out that that was really um, a long, difficult process, and it takes many days um, for each experiment. You've got to grow them first in the cells for two or three days, and then extract them, do your assays, then do the next infection. So she said, by the time you're actually developing your Western blots, you know, there's a lot of work that's been put into this, and there's a lot of attention, a lot of tension. But she said, it's really exciting then to see the the results come up um, in the dark room, and to share that with other researchers who've who've also been working um, long hours. So she was grateful to, for the um, atmosphere in the lab. People supported each other, shared their passion for coffee and also science uh, during these long incubation periods. And she realizes that she's got some really uh, great friends um, that she's made through her, her research. She does remember one um, funny day during this project. Um, she was in the middle of one of these assays. She'd already in invested two or three days in it. And all of a sudden they hear um, the alarm go off because there's a hurricane alert. <laughs> and she and her colleagues just looked at each other and they're like, we are not leaving the building. I've already invested two or three days in this experiment. I'm going to stick with it. Mm -hmm. So they can stayed in the lab, heard the strong winds howling outside, hoped that no tree would come down. And they look back on it and realize maybe that was not the smartest thing to do, but um, that was their passion. <laughs> That's great. So she also um, uh, had her daughter uh, was born when she was a master's student, and um, that also required her to develop some um, some time management skills. Um, but she is uh, really proud. She, her daughter is now nine years old and the joy of her life. She also, during 2019, um, went to work at the Institute Pasteur for five months as part of her training. And um, at that time, her daughter stayed with her parents while she went um, to work in Paris. And she said it was challenging, but at the end, um, her daughter traveled to Paris and they were able to travel in Europe together. And uh, it was really a great experience. So her advice for junior colleagues is to be passionate and persistent, believe in yourself, and just do it. She said, science isn't an easy path, but if you focus on your goals and love what you do, you'll, you'll enjoy it. And you'll meet interesting people on the way, learn a lot from them, and form good friendships. She was also really grateful for the team um, of advisors that she had. Her primary supervisor, Esteban Chavaz, demanded quality work and excellence, and that really was great training. And then um, Dr. Moreno was very passionate and shared his love and dedication um, to science, um, also inspired her. And then Katerina Guzman, um, also a doctor, um, was a strong and empowered woman who set uh, great a role model for her. And then Dr. Chacon was very creative, worked hard, and helped motivate her every day. So she's um, thriving and will soon, um, after defending her thesis, um, continue on as a staff scientist. Thank you, Michelle. Thank what you, a Michelle. lovely story. Yeah. All right. We have one email from our friend Mark Martin who writes, I was listening to your latest twim. How utterly wonderful you spotlit Irene and her team's wonderful work. She actually talked about this work with some of my first year students last year. A lot of folks are searching for antifungals in unusual places these days. And in fact, a rare publication on which I was co-author is attached, just published. But more importantly, I adored the cyanobacteria story that Alio described. But there is indeed 
evidence of photosynthesis far, far below the photic zone. Far red light is generated when very hot water mixes with cold, and some green sulfur bacteria take advantage of it. Wow. And he provides a link to that. True, they aren't cyanobacteria that linked both photosystems and only have one, but microbes continue to rule. <laughs> the idea that light is generated at hydrothermal vents still fascinates me. Yeah, I don't know anything about that. Is that some chemical reaction? Or, I mean, at some level it must be, huh? Yeah, for sure. And he gives a link for that too. Ambient light emission from hydrothermal vents on the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Very cool. Hmm. Thank you, Mark. And that'll do it for TWIM246. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIM. You can send your questions and comments to TWIM at microbe.tv. And if you'd like to support us, we'd love your support, microbe.tv slash contribute. Michelle Swanson's at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. My pleasure. Good to be with you. Elio Schechter's at Small Things Considered. Thanks, Elio. My pleasure. Thank you also. Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Am I going to get this hur hurricane tonight, Michael? Tomorrow? Is that what this It looks shows? like you're going to get a bunch of rain no, soon. I don't need that. I had enough rain. <laughs> you're, you're getting rain. Get it looks California. like it's going to hit the uh, New York area sometime tomorrow. Right. So maybe tomorrow will be a good day to do TWIB from home. Uh, no, I have to come in and do experiments. I can't. Uh oh. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.blog. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.